everyone to the Red Planet Live podcast. I am your host, Ashton Zeth, and we are thrilled to be back after a brief hiatus. I am excited to be the new host and a member of the Mars Society crew. We have been diligently working to prepare episodes with stellar guests and provide content that is both educational and intriguing. Today we have a special show planned and I'm eager to speak with today's guest, Dr. Sarah Milkovich. But before we do that, I want to take just a moment for introductions and a quick announcement. So as I said, my name is Ashton Zeth and I'm elated to be the new host of Red Planet Live. Uh, A little bit about me, my professional background is in tech sales, specifically automation and process management software. I also serve as a Mars Society ambassador. Um, My favorite band is the Goo Goo Dolls and true crime uh, documentaries is my uh, preferred Netflix genre. Uh, As a longtime space enthusiast, I am passionate about STEM education and making humanity an interplanetary species, specifically a presence on Mars. When I met with the the Mars Society team about uh, the ambassador role, the opportunity to host Red Planet Live uh, was discussed, and I gladly accepted. So here we are today, and I'm honored to be a part of the podcast, an official official member of the, the space industry. So thank you everybody for joining today and supporting Red Planet Live, supporting the Mars Society. And as you will will come familiar, uh, as as we do a few more of these episodes, you'll hear me say the best is yet to come. So one quick announcement before uh, we dive in with with, uh, Dr. Sarah Milkovich. Uh, If you follow the Mars Society, uh, you may have heard the recent news. The Mars Society is pleased to announce our partnership with Million on Mars. Million on Mars is a game where you can explore creating and growing your own settlement on Mars. Uh, It's set in the 2070s and the Ad Astra Unlimited Corporation has solved transportation, but now the challenge is on you to settle Mars. Mars on Millions uh, launched over a year ago, has over 10,000 active users, and is a Web3 game where you own your own uh, plots of land on Mars as NFTs on the Solana and uh, wax blockchains. Uh, the seamless transition between NFTs to game objects and, and back to tradable crypto assets is an amazing aspect of the project uh, because it seems like you could literally make a living just by playing the game. Try out the uh, Million on Mars. Oh, we'll share the link here so that you guys can access that. It is free to play for the first three days and then after that there are three different options for paid access. It's really cool to, to see this partnership come to fruition. Well, with that, uh, now to the important stuff. The real star of our, our show today is our guest, Dr. Sarah Milkovich. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be speaking with you today. Uh, I wanted to introduce you to everybody that's listening today. Dr. Sarah Milkovich is a NASA JPL planetary geologist and system engineer who currently works on the Mars Perseverance rover mission. She specializes in the science operations of robotic spacecraft and has spent over 15 years exploring the solar system uh, with a variety of spacecraft. You have a lengthy resume and I can (laughs) hear all about it. (laughs) Well, thank you, yes. I've been really fortunate to work on a whole host of different uh, missions, uh, also to do some research, uh, you know, mixing, science and engineering and working with some really fantastic people. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting. Amazing. I, I can't wait to hear about it. But as I said, uh, when we had a chance to sync, I want to kick off our conversation uh, by starting a reoccurring segment on the RPL podcast called Question of the Day. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, I did this for years previously. Uh, I used to do this on, on social media and, and when I worked for a, a different organization. But now feels like the right time to resurrect the QOTD. It's exactly as it sounds. It's a question. They're really basic. Uh, they cover topics all across the board. There's really no right answer. It's just meant to be a, a conversation topic. So, Sarah, are you ready? Yes. Okay. It's a little controversial. People <laughs> strongly strongly about this the question is pineapple and pizza yay or nay uh funnily enough i just had pineapple on pizza last night so yay uh especially with pepperoni you you, you nailed my answer there 
They also, yes, uh, definitely a yay. The sweet and acidic pineapple pairs really well with the pepperoni. Uh, I do love a pineapple and black olive pizza. Shout out to my mom for that combo. <laughs> uh, some people feel very strongly that pineapple doesn't, does not belong on pizza. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one. <laughs> well, there is a chat too. I'd love to see what people think. Pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? We'll, we'll be able to watch the chat here. So you let me know uh, what, you, what you think. Let's see. Well, Thank you, for Sarah, for participating in our, our question of the day. I really want to dive headfirst into the fun stuff, and that's learning about you. So in anticipation anticipation uh, for today's show, I have been brainstorming some questions to ask you, you know, from an outsider perspective of NASA and, and the space industry as a whole. There really is a special allure to working for an organization like NASA because of its obviously incredible historic accomplishments. Uh, plus the you know monumental work and research that has continued over the last you know 50 plus years uh, since the moon landing and i'm hoping today that myself and those listening can learn more about your background you know your involvement with the mars rovers hopefully get a, a sneak peek behind the scenes a little bit of life at nasa and of course you know hear your thoughts about exploring the universe and sending human life beyond earth does that sound good <laughs> sure i'm not sure where to start <laughs> in all of that it's, it's all over the board. We've got a lot, of, a lot of topics to cover, but <laughs> lots of time uh, for, for this conversation and um, I'm, I'm excited. So if, if you don't mind, let's just jump right in and start. Uh, can, you know, can you tell me a little bit about your path to becoming a scientist at JPL and, and the STEM education that you pursued in school? Absolutely. Um, so working, working for NASA and working with space exploration was actually a childhood dream of mine. Um, I grew up surrounded by, uh, uh, but actually my, my parents, geology was a hobby for my parents. My great grandfather and my grandfather were iron miners in Northern Minnesota. And uh, my grandpa would bring back interesting rocks to my dad. And my dad got into geology as a hobby um, because of that. And he sort of introduced it to to the rest of the family when when um, the rest of us came along. So I grew up always, you know, we'd go for we'd go for a car drive and and we'd be looking at uh, the the road cuts and the rocks. And so I grew up in upstate New York uh, in a, in Ithaca. It's a college town, and uh, so so I knew for, I learned I kind of absorbed from a young age this this idea that there are stories all around us, um, that the rocks tell the history. Uh, you know, each layer of a rock records the environment under which that rock formed. And then uh, you can also learn about what has happened to the rock, that rock since then. Um, but it's like a puzzle in a different language with half of it missing. And so it, it's it's the sort of appeal to the, the challenge of of the translation of all of that. And so I grew up knowing that you know, the, the place that I stood on had one time been a giant ocean, you know, there'd been a, a shallow sea there. And then much later, uh, we had, you know, glaciers, we had, you know, miles of ice above the above my head of the house that I grew up in. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, going and visiting my grandparents in Minnesota, and I would see entirely different kinds of rocks. And I would, and, and, learning the history of that just from, from, from you know, all those experiences, um, it made me really fascinated. I love a good, I always loved uh, knowing, learning about the stories behind things. And so that include, that just drew me to science because science is really trying to figure out the story behind why things are the way they are. Um, excuse me. I also loved stargazing. Um, watching uh you know watching uh, meteor showers and things like that and then i learned that planetary geology is a way to put those two things together it's it's mm -hmm. the story of the rocks that are out there in outer space um so is it safe and, to say you have a, a favorite rock or a mineral <laughs> um, i have a soft spot in my heart for hematite because that's not only what my grandpa and great-grandpa were 
digging up on Earth, but that's also one of the rocks that we got really excited about on Mars because it forms in water. And uh, and so it was one of the really slam dunk, uh, just pieces of evidence for ancient ancient liquid water on Mars from um, from the Opportunity rover. I love that connection. Okay. <laughs> So, so that led you to pursuing an education, wanting yes. science to understand how, how things happened, how things are formed. Yeah. And I also, so I also, you know, was a big science fiction fan growing up, but I also watched uh, a lot of uh, science TV shows like Nova and The Day the Universe Changed and, and things like that. And I was always fascinated by when they, I remember... Uh, some of the shows like the the Nova where it was the Voyager flyby of, I'm not sure which one, if it was, your, I'm dating myself now, which of the, the outermost gas giants it was, but um, they had, and then they had like a retrospective of all the other, uh, the, the previous flybys. And I remember just being fascinated by the idea that um, there were people in a room somewhere like first the vision that seeing the teams working together all these people coming together and then they're sitting in a room somewhere and they're seeing a picture of a place that's so far away it takes light over an hour to get here from there they're looking at a place that no human has ever set eyes on and uh just the excitement like is palpable uh, and and I was just like, I want to be in that room. Well, how amazing would it be to be in that room with those people? And so all of those kind of set me on this path. Uh, so I ended up, um, I did a couple high school internships over the summer uh, for the camera team of a spacecraft called Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous. Uh, and they took me to see the launch. And I was in high school, I was thinking about what colleges I wanted to go to, and I got to go see the launch of a spacecraft that um, I knew a whole bunch of the people who'd been working on. And I think that's, like, once all those pieces came together, like, that was the moment. That was the, like, that's yeah. the career. That, um, that, that trajectory to pursue yeah. So I um, I went, I got my undergraduate degree in planetary science, and then I went to graduate school in planetary geology for my PhD, my, mas my master's and PhD. And, uh, but all along the way, I knew that really what I was into was less the, like, I didn't want to be a professor. I knew I wasn't going to go into teaching. Um, I knew I wanted to work with the spacecraft as much as possible. So I came out to Pasadena uh, to do, a, started with a postdoc at JPL, which is where you have gotten your PhD, but you're still, you still have an advisor. It's kind of a transition uh, role. You're doing research on your own. It's more self-directed. And then, but then I was, I, I still felt like, no, I really want to play with robots. And so I switched over into um, this world of science system engineering, uh, science operations. Um, so it's where we have the engineering teams and the science teams have to come together to operate a spacecraft. And uh, there's a lot of challenges in how they come together. They have different priorities. They speak, they kind of speak different languages almost. Um, and in some cases, because we are very international, it's an international field. So in many key cases, quite literally, they're speaking different languages. Um, and so I, I get to be part of the team that brings, brings all these people together to explore the solar system. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, m myself included, but those that are listening have have probably had a similar experience, you know, stargazing and, and wanting to understand the universe and, you know, how, how did we get here? And so, yeah, that, that's really cool that, you know, that's where you started. And, and I'm sure that a lot of people, you know, have been in, in the same boat. So do you have any advice or, uh, you know, perhaps recommendations uh, for for students that are, are aspiring scientists and engineers? Well, um, you know, there it's there's you never know where life is going to take you, right? So, it's it's really hard to say. Okay, these are all like, oh, I need to take all these classes. I need to, yeah, yeah work through this set of experiences. It's a lot more to me um, setting yourself up for being able to for for oper for like getting opportunities to come your way, and then trusting in yourself to go seize them uh and i know that for myself there was a lot like it's 
there's always that little voice, especially when you're facing some giant new challenge, um, that's like, oh, is this really right for me? Am I, is this going to be too hard? Uh, and yeah. I learned early on to just ignore that voice, that yep. it was basically like, if you think something sounds cool, try it. And uh, even if you're like, I don't know how that'll help me on my journey, just if it sounds cool, try it. And because of those experiences, um, they end up adding problem solving tools into your toolbox. And that's really then makes you, it's, it's what you then bring to the table for the next set of challenges. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that resonates with me. Um, yeah, putting yourself in the, in the right place at the right time for an opportunity to present itself and ignoring that voice in the back of your head that says, oh, maybe you're not so qualified for this. Or right, exactly. Give yourself more time to prepare. Like, you know, sometimes voice it and just sees it. Um, you know, in my role as an ambassador for the Mars Society, uh, my focus is really STEM and getting students interested in pursuing careers in, you know, obviously science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, you know, what would you say to those students that are in those really formative years where, you know, I, I have to say I've got young cousins and sometimes they tend to be a little bit more, you know, focused on social media than, you know, learning, you know, algebra. So, you know, what would you say to those students to pursue those those careers and, and really focusing on your education while, while you're young, setting those foundational, you know, understandings before you can take that next leap? What, what can I say? Yeah. To what can you say to them? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. Well, I mean, there's creative, like there's creativity is needed in whatever you do, science, engineering, all of that involves creativity. And I think that a lot of times society kind of puts up this false wall between, uh, you know, science, you know, STEM science and just the STEM fields and liberal arts. Uh, you need both. You need to build your creativity. You need to communicate. You need, like, you have to practice all of these things. So, uh, you know, yes, maybe like being loving social media, like, I mean, I think especially during the pandemic, we have all been loving social media Guilty. a great yeah. deal. Um, but, you know, how can, what is it teaching you? Are you learning how to communicate with a broad range of audiences from that? You know, maybe they, uh, there's a lot of scientists out there and a lot of engineers who who use social media and, and we're all, incredibly enthusiastic about talking about what we do. And uh, you can really engage with a lot of them uh, online. Um, Absolutely. So, so that's very cool. Uh, and let's see. Um, but yeah, like it's, it's uh, they should be able to see how fast things change yeah. on, on social media and who's in and who's out. And so think about long-term, you know, your education is a, is a better long-term gamble than, uh, you know, being an influencer. A hundred percent. I completely agree with you there. Um, yes. One, one will get you a lot farther, uh, potentially. Um, so, you know, in your current role, obviously you've had, um, extensive education and, and it's gotten to you gotten you to this point where you're a science system engineer at NASA. Uh, can you walk us through what a day looks like for you? And I would be curious to know what is the best and more interestingly the worst part uh, of working at JPL. Okay. Um, one of the fun things, the things that I, one of the things I have always loved about this job is that there is no one standard day, right? Like uh, there's so many times that I have walked into work or walked started my work day and been like okay here's my list of priorities here's here's the the stuff i'm going to do today uh and then something will come in and just throw that all you know off the table and it's it's just it's sort of triaging like okay no actually this is the important thing today and that has to wait but i can't let that slip through the cracks because you know that might might have very bad uh, consequences to a spacecraft. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to work on, um, so I've, I've worked on the Mars Phoenix lander in the, the I, I was a, it was an instrument 
and I was an instrument sequencing engineer. So it's basically uh, the science team would say, here's the observations we want to take tomorrow on Mars with this particular instrument at this particular time. And my job was to say, okay, here's the set of commands to do that and turn it over to the people who stitch it all together and send it up to the, up to the, the spacecraft. Um, and that in, uh, experience is a very, that's a very different kind of day than, um, than what I later did, like later for, for Perseverance, I, I joined Perseverance as part of the science definition team. And so I've been with this rover since, uh, I think it's 2013. So I'm 10 years now. And the, uh, a lot of that was the engineering team has a question. They're trying to make a decision about something in the design, whether it's flight hardware, it's testing schedules, it's, uh, you know, what kind of, what's the header going to be on all the data packets that come back from the rover? And they came, uh, like, so So if they don't know who to go to, they would come to me. I was the lead science system engineer. Um, and at some point then for a while, I was also the science operations team chief. I knew who, I, I worked with all of the, the instrument the, the 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 principal investigators for the instruments, the ops leads for the instruments, um, and 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 my team would would facilitate between those two groups, and say, okay, you're thinking about you know formats of data products, okay, you know the right person is this this guy, uh, you know he's the expert on it, he's been work he's been thinking about this for as, as long as Mars rovers have existed, he's putting together a group. And we'll solve. You'll solve that problem over there. Okay. You have a question about how are we gonna, you know, how is the the command sequencing gonna work for this instrument? Okay. These are the people you want to talk to. Um, and then also a lot of my job on Perseverance was to design the process by which the science team dis like comes to decisions about what do we want to do next with the rover. Um, that included. Uh, rooms. We had to have room for really intense science conversations, and we also had to have very nimble turnaround day to day working with the engineers. How do you do both at the same time? And that was the problem that I was trying to solve. So sometimes it's uh, it's a lot of like, you know, just being like, okay, what is the what's the big problem for today? What's the 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 deadlines that are coming up? So what what do we have to solve first? Mm -hmm. uh, and who are the right people to pull into a room or a WebEx room is commonly now so that we can brainstorm and 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 come up with answers. Um, so it's been really fascinating going from being at that, like the day-to-day -day turnaround of, uh, of in instrument activities and instrument sequences to the this sort of big thinky, big picture conceptual, like, okay, how do we, how do we rise to the challenge of uh, of deciding what samples to collect on Mars that could tell us about the um, the history and the potential for ancient life on Mars. Um, and what is the software that we need to support that? And what are the instruments? How do we get, we had, we currently have about 450, no, I think it's more than that now, um, science team members. Uh, and, and but a long time ago, it was really, it was me and a couple other people. We were we were running around GPL being like, okay, when the science team shows up, this is what they need. And uh, so, so yeah, it's it's been quite a ride actually. It sounds like you wear a lot of hats um, and it sounds like some days you're just triaging like what is most important and, and we'll, we'll tackle those things one, one at a time. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And so sometimes, um, sorry, I'm gonna take a cough drop here. Um, so you asked about the best and the worst. And so the best is when that all comes together and you can feel the uh, just, you know, it's, it's, it's very much like my favorite scene in the movie Apollo 13 is yeah. that scene where they're like, uh, they get all the, they get these people in a room and they're like, we have to fit the square, uh, square filter in a round hole. And this is all the things we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're just like, okay, 
sort, 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 sort. Um, I love that. That's like my favorite kind of experience. Um, there's also this uh, wonderful feeling when um, this wonderful feeling when some piece of data comes back, we learn something new that uh, even though I'm not the doing the research, but there's there's something I did something that made sure that that happened that 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 data set could be could be taken, which is the thing that happened to me. The most memorable for me was on Cassini, some of the observations of Enceladus. We just really like there was things that I had to I did above and beyond the the standard practice. And and um, so that's some of the radar data that really, really helped us figure out that there's an ocean underneath the surface of Enceladus. Um, the worst part is that it really is a series of arguments. You know, <laughs> you're going through your day and you're having, it's it's basically a series of arguments. That gets stressful after a while, um, especially when it's a series of arguments that you've had before. <laughs> And somebody just wants to have those arguments again because they didn't like the answer the first time, and so they're they're gonna just you know open it up and relitigate it, and that that can get uh, upsetting. Um, and then of course, uh, it's always a bad day when we lose a spacecraft. Um, so I've been fortunate that uh, so far, knock on wood, it hasn't happened unexpectedly. Okay, it's always been planned. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, no, I, I knocked on on wood for you, so we're gonna. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I can I can sympathize with what you're saying about you know having a, the same argument over and over again. I think anybody that's ever been in uh, a relationship probably knows how that feels, having the rehashing the the same argument over and over again, um, which, which can be frustrating, but you know, you always work through it and, and it gets better. But you, you already touched a little bit on, you know, some of my, my next couple of questions, which are specifically around, uh, you know, the Mars rovers. Uh, I know that, you know, currently there, there's a couple of rovers on Mars, including Curiosity and Perseverance, which, which mm -hmm. you're working on. Uh, you know, to date, what do you think from your standpoint uh, is the, the most important discovery made by the two rovers on Mars? Um, the two that are still there. The two that are yeah so curiosity and perseverance uh so you know curiosity really brought uh, a full geochemistry suite to mars um to answer the, qu the question was mars ever habitable and that was you know like this whole question of of was there ever life on mars is a question that we've been trying to answer since before the space age started right. and of course, Viking asked that question, the Viking landers, and they brought along, uh, uh, you know, experiments, but we didn't know enough about Mars at the time for the experiments to, to be tuned properly. Uh, so um, we didn't know that there's perchlorate in the dust everywhere on Mars, and that will mess up the kind of experiment that they ran with, uh, with Viking. Um, so I think it's, for curiosity, it's really that, um, you know, all the conditions were there to support life uh, billions of years ago on Mars uh, is, is to me, like, that's such a profound and profound discovery. And it's so foundational for Percy, for Perseverance to, like, really built off of that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that actually, I think, was has fascinated me the most of you know so perseverance we've just reached one mars year on on the surface and we're coming up on our uh anniversary of landing in february yeah and so we spent the first we spent a good chunk of time exploring the crater floor of jezero and we found that um the floor of this crater so underneath the delta and 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 everything um is this giant lava flow that uh, it looks like, uh, so so this is gets, you know, kind of into the geology of, uh, quite a bit, but it's a cumulate flow. So that means that we had a lava flow that was thick enough that it cooled slowly and uh, olivine rich, uh, the olivine rich crystals sort of came out and grew. Uh, and then at the top, the 
melts, um, like it changes the composition of the lava flow as you get the first things drop out and then the, the composition changes and you get different minerals up towards the top. And it looks like that's the situation that we have at the floor of Jezero Crater, but you have to have a really thick lava flow in order to do that. So um, there's more to that story that we don't know yet. We still we have to figure that out, but we were very surprised um, to, to discover this, this olivine cumulate on the floor of the crater. So since discovering that accumulant, has that been a focus? Hey, we've we've uncovered this and now we're going to focus more of our, our attention on that? No, because, um, you know, perseverance is really the fundamentally about this search for the uh, evidence of ancient life. Um, mm -hmm. And I do want to emphasize it's ancient bacterial life. It's nothing like, you, you know, if you... Around. Not, not, yeah, it's not, it's not, you know, uh, ice warriors from Doctor Who or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's ancient stuff. And, uh, and so that is not that, that lava, that, that cumulant flow while geologically fascinating. Uh, and, th and then, and there's evidence there's ancient, there's later water interactions with that those those minerals that could be interesting from a uh you know biology perspective from yeah. a like you know habitability perspective i should say not a like that's more a fundamental um the real focus is on the delta and so that's where we drove so so you know we we did like this like in-depth investigation of the crater floor, and then we drove a great distance to do an in-depth uh, investigation of the bottom of the, the delta, and mm -hmm. then we're driving up onto the delta soon. Um, and that was actually part of that strategy, is part of what I worked on way before, is, is this idea that you, you pick an area that's going to be really rich scientifically, and you investigate it, and then you leave it. And if it's, if you decide that it's like worth it, you can go back. But you, we have so much to do with this rover. It's so scientifically ambitious. We have to keep moving. Uh, and so we have, we've collected, we have to be very thoughtful about how we collect the data, what kinds of, rather than just saying, let's plaster lasers, laser zaps and images every single place. It's much more like, okay, what are the questions that we're asking? What is the uh, the type of information that we need to answer that question? Well, let's make sure we get all that in the plan and down on the ground. And then as we drive and we we are doing the same for the next spot, we can also be chewing over that data. Um, so that's that's really uh, how perseverance works, the the operations. Excellent. No, that that's great. It's nice to have a little bit of kind of background understanding of of the strategy and, and you know kind of the tactic for how you're going to collect that data and then analyze it while continuing the the mission uh, speaking of, of perseverance uh, I you know had the opportunity to watch uh, the perseverance landing live via NASA TV uh, which was incredible uh, you know I can't imagine how everyone within NASA including yourself uh, you know must have felt in that moment can you describe that experience for us you know what was what was going through your mind at that point um, well, uh, on the one hand, there was the sort of the jitters and the like, oh my God, I hope I still have a job in, in an hour. <laughs> sure, okay. <Yeah. laughs> I put so much of my life into this river. I hope it works. Um, but yeah, there's, there's uh, anxiety, but also just great elation that I mean, it's, it's, for me, it was less like the actual moment of landing, but it was, it was more of, it's more of this ongoing, like the, this thing that I used to be PowerPoint slides and like going all the way back to the science definition team, this thing that was, that were PowerPoint slides and like printouts that we taped to the wall in this one conference room at JPL and we stared at and we were like, does our logic hold true the whole way? Are there any missing steps in it trying to explain what we want to do and why we should send this rover to do it? Um, and the fact that that has now turned into hardware on Mars is still mind boggling to me, honestly. Like the, I also remember the moment that 
when we were, they were building the rover over at JPL and you could go to the clean room and you could see it. And for a long time, it was just like this little box of wires and box of wires. And then they flipped it over and then it was a big box with wires. And then one day they put the wheels on and you're like, oh, it's a rover. <laughs> okay. So it's just like, it's, it, I don't know. It's hard to, it's, it's hard to wrap your brain around even when you work on these things. Um, but I do have my, I had a great experience um, when the, we also, so, so the science team watched the launch and the landing remotely, just like everybody else. We were, we yeah. were originally supposed to have gotten together in Florida to watch the launch, but of course, pandemic. So we were all watching it uh, at home on online. And uh, it was, I don't remember exactly what time it landed uh, in, or it launched in Pacific on on the east, on the Pacific time zone. Um, it's all kind of a blur at this point. But I do remember, I woke up my son. Uh, he, he's he's he was in elementary school at the time, um, and to to come watch the launch. I was like, come come watch the launch with me. And he just looks at me and he goes, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> and and I was like, too bad. <laughs> this is you, like, have you have no choice. You have to come. You have to come hold mom's hand while she watches this thing she's been working on for so long get strapped on top of an explosion. <laughs> need need you for moral support because mm -hmm. a lot rides on this, and you know, you you want this to be successful too, son. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, I wonder, you know, what is that like, uh, you know, has he, has he expressed to you um, kind of his experience in school with, you know, having a, a, a mom that works for NASA, you know, like I mentioned before, it has this special allure. Uh, does he, does he understand how cool that is yet? Or it's like, oh yeah, my mom works at NASA, you know, like rovers. Yeah, I think cool. <laughs> he, uh, I helped give his class a tour of JPL uh, many years back, and I've yeah. gone into the classroom over the years to talk about the rover and, and Mars. So um, I think he he does enjoy like that kind of reflected glory a little bit. Um, and I know <laughs> that that the other other <laughs> uh, like I know other kids are like, Ooh, you know, hey, your mom works at NASA and. Um, but I do know the the class while I was at my my work from home desk uh, watching the landing, he was just on the other side of the wall in his room with his Zoom school class watching the landing as well. So that they all paused, he got them all to pause the class so that they could watch watch the landing together too. So I think I think he uh, he gets a kick out of it. He uh, he I, he did have a there was a a. Um, summer camp out here uh that was doing it was a a local museum was doing a kids thing for like one week of of let's pretend we're building a rover to mars and i was like do you want to take that and he just kind of looked at me and i was like or do you get enough of that at home and he was like yeah i get enough of that at home i was like okay yeah. fair i could do your own thing <laughs> i could run this this isn't anything i i don't already know he's gonna he's gonna be teaching everybody else at, <laughs> i can imagine that <laughs> Well, you know, speaking of getting the rovers to the surface of Mars, uh, I know that there are tens of thousands of individuals that are uh, involved in the process of, of building and testing and launching and then managing uh, the rovers once they're on, on Mars. Uh, can you highlight some of the major challenges of getting a rover to a distant planet like Mars? Uh, yes. Um, I, so so there's, there's the obvious ones, you know, launching and landing safely right. um there's there's a lot i mean as you said there's there's thousands of people who work on these things that's a lot of moving pieces a lot of um a lot no one the no one person has all of the knowledge to build this rover and to get it to mars and so you have i mean with with perseverance and with curiosity we had uh instrument teams that were, you know, instruments built in other countries that were contributed from other space agencies. So right. we had to know, uh, we had to know that we were that they were going to fit on the rover, that all the pieces were going to fit together, that we were going to be able to just, 
you know, that a command from the rover uh, computer would make it to the instrument computer kind of thing. Um, we had to, uh, so there's there's the the personality aspect of having such a big team, um, you know, trying to trying to juggle the work culture in and and um, schedule in other countries, you yeah. know, where they have like different different holidays. Not only is it a time zone thing, and a uh, you know. Uh, folks in other countries working with us, but they're not work necessarily working in their first language. Um, right. But then there's the fact that like a huge portion of Europe goes on vacation for a big chunk of August and mm -hmm. except for Norway, which does it in July. <laughs> so like just some of that kind of juggling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so, so that's some of the major challenges. There's, um, we have, so the whole sort of field of system engineering, uh, helps with some of those challenges. We'd spend a JPL part of, part of why we've been so successful with planetary spacecraft is that we do spend a lot of time, uh, basically sitting and thinking and writing down exactly what we need from the, uh, you know, whether it's what the hardware is doing, like from the big picture of, you know, the, the the project system shall land on Mars. Uh, that's one of the things you write down, and then that flows down to the next set. And like, okay, this had like in order to have that happen, this has to happen with the hardware. This happens to happen with software. This has to happen with the operations team, and and it trickles down down into the steps that you can actually take. And so we spend a chunk of time working our way through that to improve the chance that when we get to the final stages, stuff actually fits together. Mm -hmm. um, which is not to say it works perfectly every time, but yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> a game of telephone. Yes. So many different people, like you said, across time zones and countries and cultures and languages uh, to try to get everybody to, to say, you know, the same thing that we're going to be able to communicate it to the next person and if we're going to be able to replicate it uh, successfully, I, I imagine it gets very complicated. Uh, so there's a lot of those processes in place to make yes. sure smoothly. But it's always difficult when you are doing something that nobody's ever done before. Uh, and so yeah. that's, uh, that's another, like it just budgets becomes a big challenge. And of course, you know, every, like that's a complicated can of worms, but it's hard to put a number. You have, like there's people who have to figure out how do you put a number on how much it's going to cost to do something that nobody's done before. Um, and and that's another challenge, frankly. Um, there's other, you know, there's other sort of, I'm going to call it more mundane, although it's not mundane at all, issues like uh, the radiation environment of space. Uh, we need uh, our computers to withstand just the conditions of space. And so, you know, like we all now have these, like our phones and our tablets can do so much, but we've got this, they've, if you think about uh, the conditions of launch, the conditions of landing, the conditions of outer space, all of these things that you have to survive. And there's no, there's no opportunity to go in and fix anything once mm -hmm. it's off, off, the earth like right. you can do a software upgrade but that's it right. so um we use actually very old uh chips that have been built specifically for outer space and they're rad hardened and um i remember uh because we were trying to do perseverance as close to build to print as curiosity use as much of the engineering designs as possible and mm -hmm. we hadn't yet gotten even like even the first kind of approval for for doing for building uh Perseverance, we were still like, we hadn't even, I think, gone through mission concept review, which is like the very first fundamental basic thing. But the company that had made the chips that Curiosity was built with was not going to make them anymore. So we were like, oh, we better go buy a whole bunch just so that we have them because mm -hmm. we hope that we hope that we will be a real mission. So just some of these logistics get amazing. <laughs> A lot of layers of complication there, I, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, that, that's that's really insightful. Um, I know we, we've got, uh, you know, roughly 15 more minutes scheduled. So I've, I've got two more questions for you. And then um, I encourage anybody that's listening that has a question that you want to ask Dr. Sarah Milkovich, uh, feel free to put that in the chat and we'll, we'll try to get those answered. Um, but the, the two questions that I have for you, um, you know, the, the Mars Society and myself believe that, you know, Mars is the appropriate next planetary body to, to send humans where we will eventually, uh, you know, establish a settlement becoming interplanetary species. Uh, in your opinion, do you believe that Mars is the, the next giant leap for mankind? Why or It's, you know, there's the part of me that loves science fiction and the part of me that loves, you know, like the Apollo and and now Artemis, um, that is wistfully wishing it to happen um, on a more practical side. I sure. know too many ways that Mars can kill you. And I know uh, like there's a lot of technical challenges. There's a huge number of technical challenges. And I'm sure that we could sit and we could run through all of them and probably the chat would like work on trying to nitpick uh, ways around reality in in certain ways. But um, like fun, there's also the fundamental psychological aspect, which is like you look at how hard it's been for people to wear masks and stay indoors in this pandemic, and uh, and then you think about living somewhere where you will never feel the breeze on your face. You will never be able to go outside without being entirely enclosed in, you know, pretty heavy duty spacesuit because of the radiation. You have, uh, you can't bring your spacesuit inside your, your, your house either because of the dust situation on Mars. Mm -hmm. And if you try and seal up a lava tube or something and pump it full of, of air, then you're never going to see the sun either. So, um, you know, I think I, uh, I know so much about the, just the challenges of operating a, a, a robot at Mars, and I've seen how we've behaved for a while. So I'm feeling pessimistic, let's say, and I need to emphasize that that's me personally, that is not an official NASA statement or anything like that. Um, I also, uh, for me, the excitement is really more about the science mm -hmm. and uh, robots are always gonna be able to go where people can't. And so that's why I like working with robots. <laughs> yeah, I see where you're coming from. Yes, and you know, in, in every situation, you gotta have the, the person that's playing devil's advocate. It's, it sounds really <laughs> it's exciting, but you know, we have to look at what those, those harsh realities are and Yes, the, the psychological challenge, uh, you know, it may be just as difficult or, or maybe more than, than the physical. Um, you know, like you said, if you're, you're trapped there by yourself, never feeling wind or sun, you know, that, that could do a lot uh, to somebody mentally. Um, so that's always a, a risk when you potentially send humans, you know, off of Earth. Um, yeah, that, that's a good one. Uh, you know, one question that I had for you, uh, it's it's a little tidbit about kind of, you know, myself, but also I, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. My friends and coworkers, some of who are, are listening right now, hi guys, uh, all know me as the space nerd and they, and they come to me with questions about, you know, NASA missions, Mars conspiracy theories I, I get often. And sometimes they want me to fact check articles uh, that they see online and they're like, is this true? And I'm like, okay, I, I'm not the expert there. Uh, but one question that I receive all the time uh, is about the funding of these programs. Is, is it worth the money to send rovers, astronauts to space and, and, and Mars? So, you know, Sarah, my question to you is, what do you say to those people who think that funding space programs is not a good use of tax, tax dollars and that that money should be used and spent here on Earth? Well, uh, you know, first of all, all of the money is spent here on Earth. We're not, you know, launching ATMs into space. So uh, there are, we actually do a great deal with the money we get and we get a very small, tiny prep fraction of the of the taxpayer money. Um, it mostly goes to other parts of, of the federal government. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, there's a ton of, there's a ton of things that NASA ends up uh, inventing or, um, you know, optimizing, like on the way to building these, 
these things that uh, there's a ton of spin-off technology that comes back to Earth. Um, you know, the thermal blankets for spacecraft, those that turned into uh, the the emergency blankets, the shock blankets um, that, uh, that that folks get. There's, um, you know, I think quite famously now, uh, the CCD cameras, the little camera, tiny cameras in your phones yeah. uh, are from NASA, that's from NASA. Mm -hmm. uh, on a sort of more personal note for me, like there's some of the techniques used for analyzing data. Um, there's uh, a tech, some techniques that were used for, for looking at, um, I'm not sure exactly what, what kind of data originally, but it's, uh, it, it pulls out a lot more information um, through this, this this sort of algorithm and analysis, uh, and it is now adapted and used to assess mammograms and is helping catch breast cancer uh, earlier and earlier. And my mom is a breast cancer survivor, and so for me, that's a very personal, you know, yes, that was a that was a good thing. Um, so there's there's uh, there's just so many ways, um, and then we've also learn wherever we go, we learn about. Uh, when we learn about these other planets, we're learning about our own as well. The first concept of the greenhouse effect and this idea that changing the atmosphere, <coughs> excuse me, can change, can actually raise the temperature of your planet, uh, came from studying Venus and trying to understand why Venus is the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, so so there's there's all sorts of things, you know, we have to build materials that stand up well in very cold temperatures. Uh, you know, we have to build materials that stand up really well in really high temperatures. All of that is uh, applicable in one way or another. Yeah. And then there's also just that like inspirational thing. There's, a, there's so many people who like just being able to step outside of yourself for a while and kind of Think about the bigger picture. Um, think about the fact that, uh, you know, we are on this. The more we look out in the rest of the world, the, so I mean the universe, the more we realize how special this planet really is. So, yeah, absolutely. You, you nailed a lot of the points um, <laughs> that, that I was hoping for uh, in, in my, my presentations um, that I've, I've been delivering as a Mars Society ambassador to, to students. Uh, Excellent. You know, talking about why it's important. And I, you know, I think I've got six reasons on there. And, um, you know, one is that uh, the, the technological developments that come from the space industry. So, of course, you know, they're, they're middle school students. And so I tell them like, hey, you know that, you know, that camera mm -hmm. in your phone comes from the space industry and, you know, uh, water filtration systems, uh, firefighter equipment, workout equipment comes from uh, the space industry and creating those uh, those tools and that equipment so that you know astronauts could could survive in space and those things have since trickled down and you use those in your everyday life and you may not even realize it and then obviously you know there there's the inspiration aspect you know encouraging and inspiring that the next generation to push the boundary of, of what we were capable of and, and learning about ourselves and the universe. And so, yeah, thank you for highlighting those. I, I know that I'm on the right track when I say this. <laughs> Excellent. I'm not, making, I'm not just making that stuff up anymore. Um, so, so thank you for confirming that. Um, I know we have a couple questions um, from our listeners. So we're going to try to highlight some of those. Uh, the first question that I see uh, is from Graham. The question is, some people like Steve Benner have argued that we need to get better life detection experiments to Mars before humans can get there and the clock is ticking. What do you think? Uh, you know, from a uh, astrobiology perspective, if you ever want to know, did Mars ever host life or is there is there current life deep underground? You got to do that before humans, like what humans are... Uh, ugly bags of mostly water, as Star Trek puts it, but, um, you know, we're sort of a walking pig pen of, of contamination and, you know, sending, sending humans to Mars uh, is going to have an impact on the, the uh, you know, the system. Um, so it's, it's all a matter of priority. It's a matter of funding. Uh, I don't have a better answer than that. <laughs> 
All right, I like it. Uh, let's see, another question. Uh, this is from Robert. Uh, when will we see, persever see perseverance-sized helicopter rovers on Mars, Venus, or Titan? Ooh, how much money do you have? Uh, <laughs> that's hugely, ex that would, that's a giant expensive thing. I mean, and so like, like a lot of times when we have a, a, a really complicated engineering problem, you can solve it with enough money and time and uh, you don't always have enough money and time to solve all of the problems that you end up having. Uh, the ingenuity, the helicopter that's yeah. traveling with Perseverance is really tiny because the Mars atmosphere is so thin. It has hu these huge blades and really tiny, very lightweight uh, body. They're talking about, they're trying to, they're looking into having bigger but not rover sized helicopters um, to help with the sample return aspect uh, as, as the follow on mission to Perseverance. And uh, and then, uh, but uh, there is also the, the Dragonfly mission to Titan, which is like a, you know, quadcopter kind of kind of thing uh, that uh, is, is, you know, being being put together and it's 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 very cool. It's gonna fly around and land and and on Titan, Saturn's moon, and have a little drill to drill into the surface. Have some some uh, chemistry instruments to analyze the material um, to look at what is the surface of Titan's a really fascinating place. And you know, you could have a whole nother one of these conversations just about Titan. Uh, so that one's coming. And then beyond that, who knows? We now have proved the concept of of a helicopter on other planets. We'll see what happens. See if we can do that. Okay, well, I know we're coming up on time. I got one more question before before we close it out. Uh, and this is from uh, Roger, who is a, a fellow ambassador. Uh, his question is, last September, a video from the Mars helicopter showed a piece of debris hanging from one of its legs, a membrane-like streamer that fell away during flight. Any update on that? Yeah, we had the FOD, we call that foreign object debris, uh, is when what we call it when you, you see something in the pictures that you're like, that's not that's not supposed to be there, that's human made. Um, we think that it's probably uh, little bits of, I think the, the last time I heard the, the best the best guess right now is that it's little bits of the entry, descent, and landing system. You know, the parachute, the um, all the cords, the you know, all of that is still. It crash landed on Mars. It's blowing around. I mean, the breeze is not like a strong breeze, but there is a breeze, mm -hmm. and so um, we we think that the helicopter picked up a little bit of that um, at some point during its travels. Um, we've seen other fod uh, on like on the rover itself um, or on the ground, uh, and and so some of that is stuff you know coming off of the rover. Uh, and and some of that is little bits from the the entry descent and landing system on the ground. There we go. All right, all right, Roger. There you go. That that's what it is. Uh, well, there we go. I, I think uh, we'll we'll leave it at that. I know there were some other questions, so thank you everybody for for submitting those. I wish we had more time to to read every question, uh, but I did get an update. We had. Um, Two to one, pineapple on pizza voted yes. So <laughs> excellent. Pineapple people were were all in the same boat. Um, so so thank you for voting, guys. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, this has been great, uh, Dr. Sarah Milkovich. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. It's been a an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Uh, you've really shared a lot of great information, and I know that myself and and the rest of us we've all learned something today. So thank you so much for your time and and helping me thank kick you. off my first episode. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you for thank you for having me. It's been fun to chat, and um, you know, hope to hope to come back someday and we can chat some more. I think we can make that happen. Uh, well, I, I would love to have you on again and, and continue the conversation. I've got other questions that I didn't get to, so uh, we'll leave that for for version two uh, when we pick those up. But wanted to say um, a huge thank you uh, to our executive director James Burke, our PR director Michael Stoltz. Um, James Melton, thank you so much for, for recommending this. Uh, our friends at Liftport, Michael and Leah, thank you so much for your help. And a major thank you to everybody who's joined in and listening. Um, I, I'm so appreciative of you guys for, for joining today's uh, podcast and, and submitting your questions and engaging. Uh, you know, you make you make my job a little bit easier when, when we've got uh, those members that are listening. So thank you again. I appreciate everybody.
we'll wrap it up here. I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next month. Bye everybody.